Chapter twenty six of From the Easy Chair, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. From the Easy Chair, Volume Two by George William Curtis. Chapter twenty six. The Grand Tour. Nobody could have written this book, a London review recently said of Longfellow's Hyperion who could have reached the Rhine in a few hours. It needed the ocean, thought the critic, to make the Rhine and Switzerland remote and romantic to the poet. But he forgot Child Harold, a book written by an Englishman, which has given to the Rhine and Italy a more romantic glamour for John Bull upon his travels than any book he reads. It is not the distance, it is the imagination susceptible to association which is the secret. The traveller of to-day is not likely to be affected, as his father was, by the melancholy melody of Byron. But it is an interesting illustration of the power of his genius that Byron has imposed this interpretation of so many scenes upon the mind of the modern English and American observer. His view makes Italy, as Sir Thomas Lawrence's portrait of John Kemble made Hamlet, if we stand in the capital and look at the dying gladiator, we must also see his young barbarians all at play upon the Danube. If at Terni we see the Velino cleave the wave-worn precipice, the Byronic lines murmur along our lips. As we step into the gondola and glide gently upon the Grand Canal, memory keeps time to the measure of the dipping oar with the words whose charm is unexhausted. In Venice Tasso's echoes are no more, and silent rose the songless gondolier. At a tomb in Aqua, at Clarence sweet Clarence, we are still led, like Dante, by the singing guide. The guide-book is full of him, the travel-books are full of him, he is familiar almost to commonplace. Who comes to Belgium's capital for the first time without listening for the sound of revelry? who goes to the field of Waterloo remembering the unreturning brave, and does not sigh, and Ardenne waves above them from her green leaves. Sitting quietly here in a great land which looks to the future, not to the past, it is pleasant to think of the throngs of travellers who have gone hence for a summer wandering in Europe. Yet so intense is the delight of European travel, so freshly remembered is it, when almost another generation of travellers are ready to begin their journey, that the patriarch who goes to the wharf to say farewell to the newer voyagers looks at them with tenderness and pity, and there is even a sadness in his congratulations, not because they are sailing away, but because he cannot believe that they will find what he found, nor possibly enjoy what he enjoyed. These newer voyagers will see a France and a Switzerland and an Italy, they will eat oranges at Sorrento, and gaze upon the Mediterranean from Capri, and hear the fisher's song at Amalfi, but they will not hear and see through the enchantment of lapsed years. In his lively book of travelling letters, Dr. Bellows says that he went up the Nile in a steamer of seventy berths. An ancient mariner of the Nile cannot comprehend it. In a steamer? With paddles or screws whisking the water? And steam blowing off? making innumerable miles a day a round trip to philae in two weeks or a week but how could you see egypt or feel it that slow floating southward upon white wings the sinking deeper and farther from the world we knew the sense of infinite strangeness and distance the weeks passing with no sign of accustomed life slowly one by one the temples the tombs in the still days the crew dragging the boat along and singing the wild minor refrain a voyage of wonder and of dreams is that egypt to be seen in a steamer it is useless to say that you may go in the old way if you choose you cannot go in the old way because it is no longer what it was if there be a newer you may drive from london to oxford but is that going by the old english stage-coach when it was the only way when the guard wound his horn, and the cherry-nosed coachman threw down the ribbon at each relay, and the neat inn stood smiling with open doors, and Charlala sped the nimble team by the park gate and the hawthorn hedge. 
you may go by sloop from new york to albany but is that now the romantic hudson voyage which it was when it could be made in no other way no sensible ancient mariner will quarrel with all this nor desire to banish the steamer of seventy berths from the nile when he shakes a farewell hand with the youth who are going to run up to rome by train and are not going to stop at a certain point upon the campagna and run forward to the top of a hill whence they can see far away upon the horizon the faintly outlined dome of st peter's and who are not going from leghorn to florence through the grape harvest their carriage heaped with the luscious clusters but are to whiz through tuscany in an hour or so the regret in his tone is not personal or selfish it is for a whole order of things passed away such an ancient mariner would however be indeed sorry if he supposed that anybody suspected him of a very common and very odious kind of remark against which he kindly warns all the throngs of travellers of whom mention has been made the remark in question may be called the capping remark thus one traveller says to another as marco polo to george sandys you went to jerusalem yes and to jericho yes and to the jordan yes did you see the white stone on the bottom near where the river flows into the dead sea well let me see i don't exactly seem to remember that i did precisely see that ah replies marco polo it is a very brief sound but being interpreted it means then my dear george sandys you might just as well not have seen the jordan at all not that the white stone was famous or worth seeing but that marco polo wished to rub in upon george sandys's mind the conviction that he polo had seen more than he sandys in the same direction the capping process sometimes leads to very droll results young green heard gray and brown comparing their notes of travel each was naturally anxious to have seen and done rather more than the other but it appeared that each had been in about the same places and had had very much the same experience lago maggiore is a lovely sheet of water remarked gray truly exquisite replied brown and isola bella is most beautiful suggested gray dear me dear me approvingly assented brown how high is the statue of san carlo borromeo asked gray about sixty feet answered brown it's a wonderful prospect from his eye said gray whose eye asked brown san carlo borromeo's replied gray whose mind instantly suspected that he had caught the adversary and who followed up his advantage vigorously and suddenly of course you went up san carlo up san carlo you mean the church at oh no the statue on lago maggiore went up the statue what do you mean snapped brown foreseeing discomfiture oh i thought you probably knew retorted the triumphant gray that the statue is hollow oh ah yes returned brown indifferently and you didn't go up pressed gray not exactly feebly rejoined brown nor sit in his nose continued gray not exactly muttered brown nor look out of his eyes said gray i thought i wouldn't murmured brown in full retreat oh smiled gray with the air of david holding the head of goliath by the hair and displaying it to mankind oh young green heard all this and he resolved that whatever he did not do when he went to europe he would at all hazards sit in the nose of san carlo borromeo the next year he came to lago maggiore he saw the statue he remembered the conversation and his high resolve and he essayed the deed it was fearful he tore his hands he tore his clothes he was half suffocated and wedging himself into the nose he stuck fast and was only rescued at the peril of his life when he told gray afterward and reminded him of the colloquy with brown that experienced traveller laughed until the tears ran down his cheeks my dear green said he i never went up the confounded thing but it was necessary to take brown down somehow and i employed the good saint for the purpose he laughed again to tears but mr green soberly resolved that he would eschew the capping talk of travel and he chose the wiser course 
the truth is that green should not trust too much the tales nor indeed the regrets of the ancient mariners for travellers tell no idle tales but fools at home believe them certainly when this one remarks that he feels in saying farewell that young green will never see the europe that he saw he has not the remotest idea of dimming his bright hope nor of asserting an advantage what is it indeed but a way of saying that he is no longer the same man he was if he were what would be the gain of travel is it not only an enlargement of the scenery of the mind not only a richer and more various memory that he has acquired but a riper experience he has grown wiser and perhaps all that he feels when he shakes green's parting hand is that green is not so wise as he will one day be End of chapter 26chapter twenty seven of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis chapter twenty seven easy does it governor dickens's rogue riderhood who says easy does it governor was a very practical man but there is no motto which is more susceptible of perversion. Mr. Seward said the same thing in his last great speech. I early learned from Jefferson that in politics we must do what we can, not what we would. It is not only plausible, but it is true. Yet its truth can be most readily abused to defeat everything for which it is urged. I weep for you, the walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With tears and sobs he sorted out those of the largest size, holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. It was necessary that the walrus should eat, and it was very sad that the oyster should satisfy the necessity, but it is obvious that wicked walruses who have no intention whatever of not eating oysters would sob aloud with heart-rending vehemence as proof of a virtue which they do not possess. The foes of progress are always anxious that its friends should go easily. Easy does it, Governor. But meanwhile they are anything but easy in obstructing. In the race the sly gentleman who bets on Tom whispers confidentially to the jockey who rides Jerry that he had better go easy. The friends of the saloon hope that the true friends of temperance are aware that the only way of success is to avoid fanaticism. But they omit to hide their bodies as well as their heads for they are unsparing fanatics on their own behalf. When Gustavus, in deference to his dear Griselda, promised to begin to reform the baleful habit of smoking, his Griselda was jocund as the dawn, but at the end of a week she did not observe that there were fewer cigars consumed, and she pleasantly asked him if the good resolution had escaped his memory. By no means, he answered. Quite the contrary. But you remember what Rogue Riderhood said. Easy does it, Governor we must move warily upon the entrenched enemy dearest grizzle remember that rome was not built in a day griselda remembered faithfully but still the cigars continued and upon a further gentle remonstrance gustavus rejoined certainly but we must be reasonable there are many steps my dear griselda in siege operations the great masters of war approach by parallels after making ample and thorough preparation that is what i am doing I am beginning to prepare to begin. Easy does it, you know. Don't forget Rome. Still Gustavus smoked, and still Griselda waited, and at the end of six months she asked with a smile how far he had advanced in abandoning the habit of smoking. Dear Grizzle, he answered, you remember the weeds that sprang up and soon withered because they had no depth of soil? I wish my reform of this naughty habit to be well rooted, that it may long endure. None of your spasmodic virtue your superficial goodness for me great reforms even in personal habits my dear mrs gustavus cannot be accomplished in a day even rome was not built in that time i am working for great results to which all my tastes and habits must conform i must lay the foundations broad and deep easy does it my rosebud gustavus continues to smoke and easy continues to do it 
But there is another saying quite as wise as that of rogue riderhood, which exhorts him who puts his hand to the plough not to look back. The trouble with riderhood's apothegm is that it supplies an endless excuse for not doing it. If the habit is too strong and will not budge, you can soothe your conscience and make the most plausible of pleas by insisting that human nature and long custom and uniform tradition and the honest doubt whether smoking is, after all, injurious, must all be carefully considered. That is what Dickens also calls the great art of how not to do it. My son, if you wish a thing done, do it yourself. If not, send, said the wise father, and the pioneers, the men without whose one idea and uncompromising energy and conciliation nothing would be accomplished, say with Sumner, there is but one side, and with Cato, the Linda as Carthago. It is true that everything cannot be done at once, but something must be done all the time and you will observe that it is not when the work is advancing but when it stops or goes backwards that we hear the familiar wisdom of the rogue that easy does it that is what makes it a suspicious saying what are you doing sir thundered the master to the boy nothing sir replied the frightened pupil just as i thought sir don't you know that your business is to do something when a man says easy does it he may be doing all that he can but the immense probability the almost absolute certainty is that he is doing nothing, or, like the amiable Gustavus, he is beginning to prepare to begin. End of chapter 27 Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 28 of From the Easy Chair, Volume 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. From the Easy Chair. Volume 2 by George William Curtis. Chapter 28. Siste Viator. It is still very difficult to discover where the bad people are buried. The cemeteries are still symbolically white, with monuments to the departed. Shylock and Ralph Nickleby are still upon their tombstones the most respected of deceased citizens here lies clytemestra a model of the wifely virtues whom an inconsolable spouse deplores beneath this marble in the tranquil hope of the joyful resurrection repose the remains of iago who kept the noiseless tenor of his way beyond sleeps solomon most faithful of husbands and under this turf of buttercups and daisies lie paris and lovelace arcades ambo too early lost tis pathetic to reflect how much worthier is the world underground than that which still cumbers its surface and if we whose lives are indifferent honest had only had the good fortune to die a century ago our memories would by this time have been upon our tombstones a very odour of sanctity to the sense of the age which knows us perhaps but too well in one of his terrible inscriptions suggested for the monuments of the georges thackeray says he left an example for youth and for age to avoid. He never did well by man or by woman. Has there been only one such George in the world? And if more, and in every age, in what cemetery have you found their epitaphs? Catalin was a fascinating and accomplished man. He had many followers and if his political views and projects were open to differences of opinion he was certainly well-mannered has there been but one catalan in history or is he confined wholly to a public sphere cicero described him as a corrupter of youth and no one has denied it where is catalan buried if you sought his grave by that epitaph where would you find it is there no corrupter of youth now have there been none within the last century none if you must trust the epitaphs 
how long will you abuse our patience o catalan and be annually buried like cato the censor with crosses of white camellias laid upon your coffin and wreaths of immortales hung upon the weeping effigy of virtue which guards your sleep but because a man was brutal and coarse and cruel in his life must we needs insist upon it when he is gone when mawworm leaves us must we write upon his grave he lying below defenceless hic jacet a hypocrite when o satanus departs to a sphere of light and truth shall we carve upon his monument father of lies is it manly shall we have no mercy do we really know any man and shall charity be forgotten to be human is to be frail and is not the fact that we must die at all of which the grave is proof itself sufficient comment upon our weakness here lies colonel newcombe tender generous noble childlike heart shall we add that he was credulous and ignorant dear uncle toby is in the next grave shall we shout in marble siste viator contemplate his foibles sacred to the memory of samuel pickwick is the inscription incomplete if we do not chisel beneath it a windbag pricked by death epitaphs are written more forcibly than upon tombstones when old salinus dies and the white camellias and the lilies of the valley and the rosebuds are strewn upon his bier and the universally lamented is cut upon the monument the satire is pathetic but it is slight but when the bloated old debauchee is cautiously and forgivingly praised in the papers and everybody solemnly pretends not to know what everybody knows that everybody else does know it is a sign not of charity but of public demoralization catalan corrupts youth by his example then his own offences bring him to a sudden end and the newspapers speak of him so deprecatingly so gingerly that as a good man being dead yet speaketh so a bad man being dead yet corrupteth his evil influence is not suffered to perish with him but it is cherished and extended and confirmed and his death like his life demoralizes dick turpin no longer rides in jackboots upon hounslow heath stopping my lord bishop and the right honourable the earl of garter and no longer stands at the dock the hero of st giles's and goes no longer to the gallows in a blaze of glory with a huge nosegay in his buttonhole richard turpin is a very different fellow in his costume of to-day but he is the same dick of the jackboots and the heath this vulgar robber who smirks and is called smart he drives a fine equipage and lives luxuriously and keeps a harem and frequents wall street and beats everybody in the game of making money and spending it profusely and splendidly he dazzles the eyes of the widow's son and bewilders his mind the boy sees the money with which richard surrounds himself by means which honourable men despise he hears him called good-humouredly a great rascal and sees that he buys judges and steals vast properties and procures laws to protect him the boy hears that all men are fallible and that some men are no worse than other men and that money is a fine thing and honour and truth and respect and all the rest of it are very well but see what power what pleasure what luxury turpin commands then the poor boy rushes for the same prizes and fails and ends in disgrace the jail suicide and dick turpin tosses a hundred dollars to the boy's mother and a generous press exclaims not a model man perhaps 
but what noble generosity the friend of the widow and the orphan when he dies how many poor homes will be darkened with grief yes and the hundred dollars probably pays the widow for her boy it is not difficult to be generous with the money of others a year ago it was announced that greed had given forty or fifty thousand dollars to the poor there said the admirers of turpin you may say what you will of greed he too is not a polished man he is not a scholar nor a dainty gentleman but he is one of the people he is large-hearted and generous who else has given fifty thousand dollars to the poor yes and who else has stolen five millions the politest gentlemen of the highway were notoriously gallant the marquis of gouty toe they compelled to descend from his carriage and sent the trudging market woman home in it they eased the pockets of the spanish ambassador and threw a doubloon to the leper hiding behind the hedge it was a cheap munificence so was greed's it was not his fifty thousand dollars the giving of which caused a burst of good feeling and the exclamation there now it was only a little of the millions that were not his he gave to the poor dwellers in tenement houses and it was said that there was no wretched hovel to which he did not send a load of coal or a barrel of flour during the winter months but he took them first from those wretched dens somebody paid the taxes that he stole and it is the poor who at last pay taxes where be the bad people buried when turpin dies we have greed's opinion of him and his ways gravely paraded in a newspaper madame brinvilliers opinion of lucretia borgia would be edifying reading shall we have no charity then and when a man lies dead and defenceless shall not warfare cease warfare may cease but should death condone all offences the malignant lover who denounced his rival to the inquisition and in the very moment of his rival's death by fire himself fell dead shall we write over him de mortuis shall we romans whose sons he corrupted go dumb and sorrowing behind the corpse of catalin when a bad man dies let us say that he was bad although he was very rich and very splendid shall we remember only that he gave in charity one quarter of one per cent upon the amount of his thefts the italian brigand chief when his band had slaughtered the travellers said there are twelve of us and we will share equally but the first equal share shall be for the mother of god when we tell his story shall we see only that chair end of chapter twenty eight recording by john brandon chapter twenty nine of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis christendom versus christianity it is remarkable that what is called the practical sense of christendom virtually rejects the christian ideals as impracticable its highest ideal is obedience to the divine will and its instinct therefore should represent the religious man as the perfection of vigorous manhood the more manly the finer the bloom of health the sounder the body for the sound and purified mind the truer and more satisfactory the type the more symmetrically revealed the christian man 
this is the simple and natural ideal among living men of unthwarted and normal christian excellence but so little is this the fact that the oldest traditions of christian art depict the founder of christianity himself not as a blooming man not as a figure of the inward and outward health that proceeds inevitably from complete and absolute conformity to the divine will but as a wan and wasted personality plainly worsted by the world this conception extends to the constant and organized control of the church and the general feeling of christendom regards the ministers of its religion either as official personages or excluded from actual knowledge of life not masters of the arena but professionally unfit to cope with the world it may indeed be said that the traditions of christian art show a misapprehension of the essential character of the christian faith but however that may be it is certainly true that these traditions do not misrepresent the general conception of christianity which is professed by those who practically reject its ideals here goes solomon gunnybags to christian worship on sunday morning he abashiates himself in his pew and his confession that he is a miserable sinner is so sonorous and impressive that the hearer sighs sympathetically with solomon's consciousness of the enormous burden of wrongdoing that he carries now what is solomon doing in his pew he is solemnly professing confidence in and reverence for certain principles of faith and conduct not only as lofty in themselves but as absolutely essential to his soul's salvation then unless the whole universe is a farce and religion and the soul impostures they are the most practical and practicable of all possible principles because otherwise the soul's salvation could not be made by beneficent omnipotence dependent upon fidelity to them but if some attendant spirit should say to solomon gunnybags as he walks home with a happy consciousness of duty done solomon the golden rule and the christian religion forbid you to unload upon david the stock that you believe to be very shaky he would unquestionably feel if he did not say stuff every man for himself of course christianity is an excellent thing but it doesn't mean that gunny bags does not expressly repudiate christian principle as unpractical he only believes it to be so the fundamental doctrine of the christian life is love the christian millennium is peace but it is christendom that maintains the vast standing armies and when the international peace congress meets in london and proposes disarmament the good-natured reply of christendom is well yes perhaps some time with a smile of amused incredulity as when a child seriously asks for the moon yet this is christendom and the christian principles are entirely familiar and every sunday and saint's day in all the christian churches we protest that the practice of them is essential to our soul's salvation then we wipe our eyes and smile kindly upon any one who really insists that we should offer the other cheek and forgive seventy times seven oh no we say that is an eccentric view no man in this world that is in christendom can afford to allow himself to be imposed upon if we don't look out for number one who will take charge of that precious numeral so it is that on some bright july day looking in imagination upon the respectable universal peace congress in the hotel metropole in london and hearing the bishop of durham offer a resolution for international arbitration and denouncing the folly the waste the woe and wickedness and wrong of war we hear also not the immediate and instinctive assent of christendom but its wistful prayer and half despairing hope that some time christianity may be found to be practicable and something more than a pretty dream yet is there anything more certain 
than that the christendom which actually rejects the christian ideals and principles as impracticable denounces most savagely those who practically illustrate them even if they theoretically reject them the moral of this little sermon is altogether christian for it is charity since christendom is in practice so universally unchristian and holds its own fundamental principles in such practical contempt every member of that vast fraternity should be very modest in judging others could there be a more radically unchristian figure in human history than torquemada if christianity be what it declares itself to be the least throb of sound christian feeling in his bosom would have held his hand the inquisition the fierceness of sects the religious wars offensive wars of any kind are possible only among christians who hold christianity to be impracticable yet when the easy chair saw a gentle lady going to morning prayers on a happy saint's day and heard through the open window the murmuring music of the promise when two or three are gathered together and marked during all the day and in daily conduct the unselfishness the sympathy the courtesy the kindly care of old and young the faithful doing of duty the nameless charm of lofty character the christian ideal was no longer the mirage of an unreached and unattainable oasis in the desert it was already come down to earth it was here a little heaven below end of chapter twenty nine chapter thirty of from the easy chair volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org from the easy chair volume two by george william curtis francis george shaw eighteen eighty two in beginning his tender and charming paper upon washington irving and macaulay thackeray recalls the beautiful story of which he was so fond of sir walter scott's last words to his son-in-law lockhart be a good man my dear be a good man it was a soft autumnal day the windows were wide open the low sound of the rippling tweed stole into the chamber the most renowned and the most widely beloved of living men lay dying after a career of admiration and adulation and of gratified ambition almost unexampled and in the clear and serene light of the moment that shows things as they are the one lesson and moral garnered by that marvellous life is spoken in the simple words be a good man my dear there are men whose simplicity and dignity and strength and purity of character whose sound judgment and supreme common sense dispose of sophistry and artifice in all relations and pursuits as surely and completely as the sun dries the dew they are gentlemen because they know other men only as men touching electrically whatever of manhood there may be in them and whose contact is a silent and consuming rebuke of pretence and falsehood whatever his own advantage or attraction or position or grace the man of this quality takes hold of the reality in other men man meeting man as when the grave william of orange in his plain serge coat met the brilliant philip sidney in his gold flowered doublet and neither was troubled by the clothes of the other such a man lately died the mingled strength and simplicity and sweetness of his nature the lofty sense of justice the tranquil and complete devotion to duty the large and humane sympathy 
not lost in vague philanthropic feeling but mindful of every detail of relief the sound and steady judgment the noble independence of thought and perfect courage of conviction the blended manliness and modesty of a life which was unstained and of a character which seemed without a flaw all belonged to what we call the ideal man passing from college to the counting-room of a great commercial business his sagacity energy and executive power were all brought into successful action he went to europe and to the west indies but much of the spirit of trade and many of its practices were uncongenial to him and he quietly withdrew despite wonder and affectionate remonstrance to lead his own life in his own way by taste and temperament an outdoor man he made his home in the rural neighborhood of boston busy with country cares and various studies but interested chiefly in helping other men he was allied by sympathy more than by much previous actual association with the founders of brook farm but when they chose the site for their enterprise not far from his house he was soon in the pleasantest relations with the leaders for their spirit and purpose were in harmony with his own he was a parishioner and warm and personal friend of theodore parker who lived near him and his keen common sense and mastery of practical affairs were most useful to parker as to ripley indeed the hospitality of such a man for every generous endeavour and for all new and humane ideas was a happy augury for the philanthropic pioneers because it seemed to promise the final approval and adhesion to their cause of the most conservative and substantial sentiment of the community such a man was of course an abolitionist in the days when the name was as repugnant to what is called society as the name christian was to the jewish sanhedrim or methodist to the english establishment a century and a half ago he generously aided the cause which seemed to him that of practical christianity and of american patriotism and he held most friendly relations with its chief representatives who were ostracized and denounced but his sympathy was not an abstract regard for man rather than for men and his interest in the effort to help a race and to forecast a happier social organization did not dull his heart or close his hand to the necessities of his neighbor his life indeed was a prolonged charity but a charity directed by a singularly calm and shrewd judgment his exhaustless generosity was not the sport of wayward impulse it was not a well-meaning weakness but a wise force which helped others to help themselves but he knew also when such self-help was impossible yet the strength and reserve and independence of his character were such that the man was never lost in the reformer his fine nature instinctively asserted his own individuality he quietly shunned the wearisome artificiality of society but he did not merge his own home in the general home of his friends and neighbors at brook farm and his house was always a glimpse of the social refinement and grace the mental and moral charm to which the dreams of social regeneration and the elaborate fancies of fourier pointed fancies which greatly interested him as hints of a happier social order long absence with his family in europe and a long and final residence upon staten island only matured and developed the man in whom not only was there no guile but in whom even the most intimate eye could not note a fault clarendon might have studied from him his portrait of falkland his inimitable sweetness of and delight in conversation his flowing and obliging humanity his goodness to mankind and his primitive simplicity and integrity of life disinclined to public life of every kind he was yet full of the highest public spirit 
and it was but natural that his only son should have been selected by governor andrew to command the first colored regiment that marched from massachusetts in the war in his young person all that was best in the new england youth of his time all the strength of the elder colonial and revolutionary day blended with all the grace and tenderness and gentleness of its modern life the stern old puritan softened into a humaner bayard was typified it was the flower of essex that two hundred years ago was withered in the fatal indian ambush in the deerfield meadows it was the flower of new england that fell upon a hundred redder fields within a score of years but no sorrow could fatally chill a faith which was reflected in the perpetual summer of the father's presence and temperament the frank urbanity of his greeting the hearty grasp of his hand the lofty simplicity of his courtesy were but the signs of that unwasting freshness of sympathy which held him true to the ideals and aims of earlier life his helping hand reached invisibly into a hundred homes and upheld a hundred faltering lives but besides this as president of the freedman's aid association his administrative skill and his wise benevolence enabled him to bear a most effective part in the great settlement of the war his invincible modesty and scorn of ostentation veiled his beneficent activities public and private but nothing could veil the pure and steadfast and unwearying devotion to the well-being of other men kindly but firmly he protected his own seclusion and he permitted no man in emerson's phrase to devastate his day the freshness of feeling which keeps the heart young was unwasted to the end his full life brimming purely to the sea reflected heaven as clearly when at last it mingled with the main as when it ran a limpid rivulet from its spring young and old man and boy he was still the simplest noblest most devoted best how truly he was the man that every thoughtful man secretly wishes he might be those only know who knew francis george shaw end of chapter thirty and end of from the easy chair volume two by George William Curtis